Robin Rabo. Streaming live across the globe, Angeli Rao, Rob McKnight, and David Robinson. And Robin Rabo Welcome to the Ange, Rob and Robbo Show. Indeed, welcome to a big Tuesday edition of the Ange, Rob and Robbo Show. I'm joined by Ange and David Robinson. Hello guys, hello team. Hello, hello, how are you? Now Ange, I believe you received something in the post today. Oh. I did, and it's nowhere near as creepy as that suddenly sounds. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I made that reaction. Hey. Oh, it's the new oh. Ange, Rob and Robbo mugs. And oh. I've, I've got some coming my way, but I didn't just oh. order one for me. I ordered I've ten. That one. one's coming to you, Robbo. Yes, oh, okay, that one so. can be replaced. Chuck so it out, Robbo. Which one is this? <laughs> yeah, get rid of this one. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, this is all that's left of that one. So, uh, oh, goodness gracious me. Well, luckily you'll get a new one in the next few days. And I've done an order. What I've done is I've oh, yeah. ordered a few for the diehard, diehard fans who might want one. And we're going to work out a system of who gets it, how much it is, and all that kind of stuff. So, And then um, how are we going to uh, uh, divide oh, yeah, the we'll, amount we'll of money? Split that... the, we'll split of the $2 profit. Yeah. Mm. yeah, I know. Just like bit. with the five dollar quiz that we never see. Oh, our five bucks. <laughs> <laughs> That's why we don't yeah. do the five dollar quiz anymore. And we are still doing it. It's Thursday. It's Thursday, eight o'clock. Oh Be yeah. Here. Oh sorry. I got, I've got one more chance. We'll have a meeting after the show, Robert. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I've heard that sentence many times in my career. And never <laughs> <ends well. laughs> no, I got no, sir. Look, there is a lot coming up in the show tonight. We have Jason Roses doing entertainment. And we've got to talk to him about this. He was a feature article on the Daily Mail today yes. about his appearance Woo-hoo! in Married at First Sight. <laughs> yeah. So I think his phone's really? been running off the hook. Oh, he's oh, man, now. He's Can there. you take there a is... shot of him? He's actually there, Whitey. He waits yeah. there the whole show. <laughs> So we'll be coming to him a little later. And we'll also be meeting these guys from Calgary. Did you know that snowball fighting is a sport? It's a full-on sport. We're going to meet these guys. It's absolutely crazy. It sounds bizarre. It doesn't sound like it'll be much of an interview. But, my God, seriously, you have to meet these guys. We had a chat with them, didn't we, Robbo, before? Just before before we came on air, it's going to be wild. It's going to yeah, be it's wild. Be so yeah. stick I'm around. I'm so for that sad one. I missed it. <laughs> well, you'll be able to join us when they come up a little later. Anyway, oh, let's raw. get in, let's get into the latest hot top hot button issues because controversial backbencher Craig Kelly he's quit the Liberal Party. The decision came a few weeks after Prime Minister Scott Morrison pulled him into line over his comments regarding the COVID-19 vaccine. The MP handed in his letter of resignation during a party room meeting this morning with the PM saying he only found out at the same time as the rest of the party. We had a discussion a couple of weeks ago, as you'll be aware. I set out some very clear standards and he made some commitments that I expected to be followed through on. He no longer felt that he could meet those commitments. But I can tell you, my standards don't change. Meanwhile, Kelly has made a speech in Parliament explaining his resignation. The reason for my actions that over the past several months, I've been subject to a slander and smear campaign, when my goal was only to save lives by ensuring that my constituents, Members on my and in left. fact, all Australians, were not being denied access to medical treatments if their doctors believed those treatments could save their life. Therefore, I see if I'm content to continue to act in line with my conscience and my principles and the oath that I took on becoming a member of this parliament and continue to speak fearlessly and faithfully representing my constituents, I have no alternate other than to take the action that I have. I thank the House. Kelly says he will serve out the rest of the term on the crossbench, but has vowed to support the government on bills of legislation related to the budget. And it's always controversial when this happens, isn't it? He was voted in as a member of the Liberal Party. So does he have the right to move to the crossbench? Or when people want to leave a party that they've been voted into Parliament for, should they resign completely and then run as an independent if they want? 
I think both of those statements are valid, Rob. You know, yes, our legislation says that obviously he has the right to move if, if he so desires. But also, in my opinion, yes, he should resign because, you know, Kelly openly said that he wants to be an independent so that he can carry on acting and speaking according to his beliefs, which to me means I'm going to continue spouting my bonkers COVID theories to all and sundry, regardless of public safety and medical advice. Surely he could do that even more effectively reclining at home in his lazy boy, holding court to <laughs> anyone who cares. I don't think he should be given a political platform to do that. However, if I was somebody who had voted for Kelly as, say, a specific cog in the machine, as opposed to the machine itself, I'd probably be pretty knocked off that he was bailing with so, without so much as a, you know, buy your leave to the electorate. And I'd maybe have some questions as well about whether democracy was still a thing. If my decision as a voter had been taken away from me and there was absolutely sweet FA I could do about it. Yep. Robbo, I've got to say, if I was a voter, if I was a Liberal voter and this guy jumped to an independent, that's not what I voted for. Part of it is the person, part of it is the party. People do vote against party, uh, along party lines. So... I think we've got a, a problem in the system when you can get voted in as one party and then go, well, now that I'm in Parliament, I'm going to do my own thing. I think it's disrespectful to the people who voted you in, isn't it? Yeah, look, I, I get what your point is there because I think some people will just vote Liberal because they will never vote Labor, they'll never vote Greens and they'll never vote Independent. And then the other half are voting because Craig Kelly uh, spouts the, uh, the, you know, the policy or, or the ideas that they agree with. So I think they, they, there's two schools of thought there. The other thing, and I'm going to kind of bring in another argument just really quickly for both mm. of you, and that to me, this this kind of... It looks and smells like uh, Scott Morrison can't control uh, his government. And I'm, I'm, I'm going to put that forward to you because uh, in that, that clip that we showed, it, it, was a, it was a matter of we had a talk with him. Um, he couldn't rise to the occasion or didn't, couldn't meet the expectations. Um, that, to me, is a failure of management. So let's just leave, you know, the, the leadership words, uh, it, that comes with a lot of kind of... Uh, stink i'd like to call it but if you're looking at a management point of view uh what the, the solution here was for him to uh, essentially resign from the government um and go to the crossbench as opposed to doing what he was told uh by the manager of the company by the manager of the shop by the manager of the factory uh mm. you know by the head <laughs> of the country oh, no. He did not do that, uh, and so I think on that basis alone, he should be forced to resign. Uh, but at the same time, th this is a matter... Hold on, okay. You're saying no, Rob. If Ange and I go rogue, we're okay to do that because what you're about I to say... The fire you guys. Scott he Morrison can fire can't him. fire someone... Scott Morrison cannot fire someone from Parliament. So, but he can put pressure on them to resign and quit the seat. He sure, absolutely but, can yeah, do the that. The problem is, what and, he and chose reason... to do, what he chose to do was give him a talking to, and then come out to the electorate and say, "Oh, you know, I mean, I can't control it." Well, if you can't control a backbencher like that who lives pretty much next to you in your electorate, uh, then there's a massive problem there. I think there, there's a, a problem huge here, problem Robo, with your thinking, and and. What it is? Oh, uh, wow! I'm not being. I'm, I'm sorry. If oh no 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 no! But when you say a sentence like that, I'm just going to go and put my gloves on because I'm getting ready for it. Uh, I'll, no, so, just, let me just, let, hear me out first, and then and then you can come for me. The problem here is that Parliament is different to a workplace. Uh, if a, if uh, and, and even workplaces these days, you can't fire anyone really, except it happened to me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, Made a special exception just for you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> um, here's the thing, right? Someone misbehaves in the workplace, you can fire them. A parliamentarian is something different because they are voted for, voted by the people. If you've got a rabble rouser like this guy who is nothing but an attention seeker, you know, he says, I was slandered, you know, like, give me a break, <laughs> mate. You weren't slandered. People called you out. There is a difference. You... Mm -hmm. Put mistruth. You you put conspiracy theories. You went on Pete Bloody Evans' podcast. If that doesn't talk to what kind of character you are, you are a piece of dog turd that I wouldn't 
you know, if I stepped on you, I'd throw the shoe and burn it. I wouldn't just wipe you on the grass. I would actually just burn the whole bloody thing. But the problem here is, Robbo, Scott Morrison can't control someone like that. And it's not about bad management it, it, from Morrison's part. The simple fact is that sometimes when you need the numbers because the house is very tight, you can't just afford to be getting people to resign and, and so, people hate so by-elections so, and sometimes people look, punish I, governments yes. on a by-election. I agree with you, but basically you're saying then that it doesn't matter how nice a person you are, uh, how many morals you have, uh, when you're the oppressed through the parliament, you sleep with the devil. So that's exactly what you're saying, which I'm not saying that's a bad yeah, thing. you do. But that's exactly what you're saying, which is I, I'm, not, I'm not having a go there. I just think that that's also, I take your point entirely and I, I, I totally believe you and I understand that. Isn't that just a mark on the way our system works? Sure. Is that you can have someone who, who, who says all of these, these ideas about hydroxychloroquine and, and things. Oh, thank God I said that right. Uh, hydroxychloroquine. <laughs> we did. Twice. Nailed it. Um, yeah. <laughs> but how, 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 how awful it is, that's, that's the system that we get. So, yeah, I, I, I take your point entirely and I, I, I stand corrected. Uh, I thought it, it Oh, it you're putting the boxing simple. gloves uh, away? Uh, <laughs> I'm not taking now. them off yet. We've, wait, no, no, we've still got 15 <laughs> no, minutes of the show No, you conceded. I won. That's good enough for me. We're no, no, moving on. On. But, <laughs> on this match, on this match, there might be another match. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there will be before the night is out. But uh, I'll tell you a little side thing. I was watching Afternoon Briefing on ABC with um, uh, Patricia uh, PK, and, uh, which I love. Cavallari. Uh, thank you. And uh, I can't even say Larry Emger's name, so, you know. Um, <laughs> and she had, she had Barnaby uh, Joyce on. Now, Barnaby Joyce, when this all went down this afternoon, Barnaby Joyce went into Kelly's office and was talking to him. There is a big theory on that Barnaby is trying to get him to join the National Party, which no one no. thinks is going to happen. And if mm, he joins the National Party, Barnaby will then have the numbers to reclaim oh. the leadership of the National Party. Oh, I'm going to say that's true then. He wants the power Sneaky. back. I, I reckon he that that's what's happening. He denied that, by the way. For the record, he denied that. Oh. But I really was surprised. You know, she's not pregnant. <laughs> you know? oh, he never baby. actually said that, by the way. He never denied. He never denied his partner was pregnant. I was overarching there. All right, let's move on because if you're on Centrelink, sent single and men medically fit, well, pack your bags. That's the message from the federal government. More than 1.2 million Aussies are on JobSeeker, and almost 500,000 of them are considered fully able to work. So now the federal government wants those people to move to where the jobs are. Robbo, the government says they're here to support people doing it tough, but <coughs> they want people to move to where the work is. Is that fair enough? <laughs> oh, wow. Well, I loved when this topic came up. Look, you know what it isn't? It isn't. So unless you're going to give people who have been off work for a short amount of time or a long period of time, unless you're going to give them also another kind of amount of money that goes, look, we understand, you know, and, and maybe ask them and say, do you want to move? Yeah, yeah, I'm happy to move, blah, blah, blah. People who are on benefits uh, do not have the extra money to then pick up their lives and move to a, uh, to a location that's further away. It just doesn't work that way. So it's all cute and fine when the, the federal government and the Murdoch press bless their ridiculous cotton socks where they come out and they say, oh, doll bludgers and they should move and there are jobs out there, why aren't they moving? There's no physical money to do that because, and, and the government got themselves in this uh, problem themselves. Uh, you know, New Start now, which is Job Seeker, uh, has not been raised in, I think, 25 years. And now they're going, well, hold on a minute, there are jobs out there. Oh, yeah, that's right. But you need about $2,000 to move properly, uh, you know, to move the kids, to, to do all of these kind of things. Well, why aren't you moving? This, to me, is just another classic kind of attack on the people who are on the dole. Um, and uh, and I just don't think it's fair. You can't expect people to move long distances from where they are when they've been on benefits, when the benefits have been ridiculously and I think criminally low for so many years. What if you gave the $2,000 bonus? I think you raise a really good point about mm. relocation fees. Completely fair enough. What if the government said you move to where the jobs are, we'll give you a one or $2,000 bonus? 
Absolutely, and I think that in, in, I think that's a perfect example because what you're, what you're doing there is there are a lot of people who would get a job. I know very many people. Is that true people... though? Because there is a perception that people won't move. You know, no, no, we, that's, you no, 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 no. I don't there's know where that perception is coming being, from. There, yeah, there's a, I'll tell you where it's coming from. There's a perception that comes from the federal government, which are Liberal National, and the other perception comes from uh, right-wing media, i.e. the Murdoch media, also pe places like A Current Affair and things like that. That's where that, that kind of... Um, preconception comes from or that perception that people who are on the dole absolutely no one's going to deny this there are people on the dole who uh, you know are, are dole bludgers you know they are people yeah. who are rotting the system but there are many 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 and i think after COVID, many thousands and thousands of people who would if there was a an option where they go look there is a job in long reach in queensland um, we're going to give you two grand to move your three kids there, your wife, yourself, your cars, your furniture, and there's a great job out there which you'll get. Job, uh, so you're going to get the job first. Let's say that. Uh, absolutely, that should be given when you're giving people something like, uh, you know, that's that's essentially below the poverty line, and then saying to them all of a sudden, hey, but there's a job in Broome. Uh, awesome. That, that's that's mm. bloody wonderful. There's a job in Broome. How the hell am I supposed to go from Ipswich, Ipswich in Queensland yeah, just to Broome in WA? But we just said we'll cover that. We, we, you but know, but but I, I can't yes. accept the argument that everyone's going to move. And, and to take you up on a point where we were regarding the right wing media, um, the thing is they play into how people feel. Even no, people no, in no, lower no. socioeconomic areas do. No don't like the idea of dull bludgers because there are people out there in the suburbs who no. are in housing commission or public housing, whatever it's called. Now. It was housing commission in my day, but I know the names keep changing, who go out, they work 16 hours a day, they work two jobs, you know, they go into the city during their main day. They go, My dad did two, three, four jobs sometimes. You know, he would come home from working at Telecom in the city. He'd come home, he'd go and clean a pub. You know, he did what he had to do to make, to keep food on the table for my family. But, and, and people like him, and I'm not speaking for him when I say this next part, but people like him get angry when they see people just taking handouts from the government. And I think it's unfair Absolutely. to have a go at a current affair and the Murdoch no, no, media no, no, for I don't pointing think... that out. It's, there has been many I agree uh, with you, Rob. Research. I really do. There has been many, many research, lots of research that has kind of proven that that idea is pressed into the consciousness that people are dull bludgers, that anyone who is getting benefits from Centrelink are just labelled a dull bludger. Now, it's irrelevant that your father, to the Murdoch media, and let's be frank on this, with Today Tonight and The Current Affair and Daily Telegraph and all those kind of things, it's irrelevant that your dad worked four jobs. If he was claiming any kind of welfare, then he was essentially a dull bludger because on the books, it's welfare. You're claiming welfare. Mm. Well, why are you on welfare? That's the problem. There are countless, countless articles that will show you that the uh, that newspapers perpetuate uh, the idea that if you're on benefits, you're a bludger, that you won't work. I, that you I, look, I, I, I agree with work. that. And I, if I, you remember, this began in, 19, in the 1990s with The Current Affair where they all they did for a, for a long time was... Um, Doll bludgers, doll bludgers. Look at this guy. He won't get a job. He won't get a job. He won't get a job. But they wouldn't get so jobs. Much. This was the thing, and people tried to give them jobs. That's not everyone. Jobs. And you that's need to jump in because you that's want not to say. No, but I'm just. Uh... I'm just absolutely sort of just watching you two go at it and <laughs> having a great big grin, um, you know. And actually, you know, I really do agree with you, Rob, on that. And it's not because Murdoch has been my boss twice. Uh, and I also worked for Today Tonight. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, absolutely, it was, you know, we were um, sort of, you know, told to believe that this is true, that, you know, doll, everybody on the dole is a dole bludger. You know, what comes after dole, bludger. Um, and I, I certainly believe that for, for a long time. And, you know, even sort of researching this particular story, was thinking, well, you know, with the, albeit minuscule, um, you know, increase of the dole today, um, how is that going to, even though you've increased it, say it was only one dollar, you're still not encouraging people to go to work by, you know, carrying on feeding them from the umbilical cord of put your feet up and take it easy money. So, you know, why would they move for work? But I actually really like Robbo's point that hadn't occurred to me that moving, um, mm. you know, 
costs a lot of money. Yeah. And the, if that's something that's being encouraged, which I absolutely agree with, I think it's a great idea that people do need to work. And look, it doesn't need to be from, you know, Ipswich to Broome. Um, you can actually sort of, you know, get work in your own state. And it probably would still cost you $2,000. Yeah. And government not to say, okay, we will actually give you a hand if you're willing to do this and you can show that you've um, uh, that you've got a job and that you have every intention of taking it up. Um, then I don't think it necessarily needs to be, you know, single childless people. Um, that it can be, you know, whole families who, who do go elsewhere and, you know, start a new life maybe. I think it's yeah. a great idea. Look, and, and one thing I want to be clear on, there is no shame on claiming welfare. You know, um, there is no shame getting NDIS, Centrelink or any kind of handout for the government. That's what w that's why we have a government. That's why we have the society that we have, because as a society, we generally believe that those in a better financial position should help those who aren't in such a better position. And so there is absolutely nothing wrong. My point is the perception people have, and I used the word perception, was that when people see that they're trying to do the right thing, they're out there trying to get work and there are other people thumbing their nose at that, that's when they get upset and that feeds into yeah. all the commentary you're talking about. Now, Robbo, before I move on to the next topic, I heard a bit of noise coming from your house. Are you getting hail at the Robinson <laughs> Studios there? <laughs> I was really worried because um, the lovely Angela Rao was talking and then it just started, it, it sounds more than rain so i turned off my microphone very quickly but you can still kind of hear i can it hear here. It. i think it is quite yeah. yeah it's quite it's quite bad um yeah That's um, well, I wonder what it was. robo we we broadcast under torrential conditions from um brisbane <laughs> how we didn't Gold get Coast. electrocuted so I don't you know, know the thing is <laughs> I have no fear of electrocution anymore because how no. we did not get electrocuted during that shoot, I will never know. So, Robert, your studio could flood right now. You're going to be fine. All right, my friend? That's right. And, and yeah, you used, you used to say... If anything does happen, you used to, I'll get in the car. Yes. I'm a two-hour drive away. Yeah, great. Yeah. I'll be right there waiting for your CPR. Yeah. Uh, you used to say, Rob, that it doesn't rain on a McKnight shoot. Oh. I think you've changed that now to being you don't get electrocuted on a McKnight shoot. I think that's still just... How encouraging. Very important. You know, you know that lasted for 25 years. It I know never it rained know on it one of my shoots. And then when it did... Boy, did it rain. It, yeah. All right. Can I say really quickly, though, because mm. we had done over our time uh, working together on Studio 10, there were a plenty of times either when I was just doing a live cross or we were doing a full kind of outside outside somewhere. Um, <laughs> it's just because I went against the Murdoch press and the Liberal Party. Can they have, can they have control over the weather? Um, I was just quickly saying it would always dry up before we actually got there. Uh, so, yeah, 25 years is a very, very good run. It was a good run. Good run. All right, let's move on because outspoken and popular media commentator Piers Morgan is once again on the wrong side of the headlines. The, this time, though, it's not from the public, so to speak, but from industry colleagues. And it started with this tweet. A former producer openly warning others not to work with Piers Morgan. This then captured the TV host's attention, as you can imagine, and he responded in kind. And he's saying, Hi, Adil, you spent precisely two months working on Life Stories in 2010, and judging by your CV, that was the pinnacle of your TV career. So you really don't need to worry about getting any more job offers from me, because I'd rather employ a lobotomized aardvark. This then prompted nearly 1,200 unnamed industry people to write an open letter to his current employer, ITV, in Britain. The anonymous authors spoke about bullying and their need to bring attention to it. Piers responded, beyond parody. A, Mr. Armani targeted me, saying he wanted to poke the beast. B, I am therefore the victim. C, these signatories are now victim shaming me. D, I have no choice but to now report my own ordeal to the hands of these 1,200 victim-shaming bullies to ITV. Oh, <laughs> this is the definition of woke. <laughs> a guy targets a presenter. The presenter responds, but now the presenter is the bully. Look, had you ever read... 
Piers Morgan. Have you ever seen him on TV? I'm not going to be surprised. He may not be a particularly nice man to work for. But give me a break when you target someone on Twitter and then you get their full force and then you go, I don't like that. You're being mean to me. Nick off. You know, and these 1,200 mm-hmm. unnamed people, put your name on it or it doesn't count. Give me a break. Angelie, the floor is yours. <laughs> Are you sure? Are you and Robbo sure? <laughs> oh, sorry. Sorry, Angelie. Sorry, 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 sorry. Okay. Uh, you go. Very kind but actually, Angelie, what I was going to try to say, Angelie, just, Angelie, can I talk for a minute? Angelie, Angel, I just want to talk. No, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. I'm kidding. It was a joke. Don't write. Oh, Don't guys. write. <laughs> um, no, you're completely right, Robbo. I did laugh at this. I mean... Uh, Okay. By not the way, I'm Rob. Robo's the other one. Oh, did I say Robo? <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm getting you so confused. You're basically one and the same now. <laughs> um, are you saying white boys all look the same? Of course. <laughs> Can we let the woman speak for it? We're going to give her 20 seconds. 20 seconds, (laughs) Ange. That's the thing. That's the thing. Seriously, it's like everybody knows Piers Morgan's shtick. That's just who he is, you know. Say you worked for Howard Stern or, you know, or Kyle Sandyland or anyone whose job is to deliberately rile people up. Wouldn't you expect that some massive great <laughs> was going to come back at you, yeah. um, you know, if if that's the way that you wanted to go? And, you know, he, he went on to, to Twitter to do this. As far as I know, there was no sort of like, oh, um, there was an internal inquiry and, and here are all the things that happened. I haven't read anything about um, what he's alleged to have done. Um, you know, maybe he is a gigantic bully. Um, you know, well, he's certainly a great big man, baby, when it comes to um, Meghan Markle. Um, you know, and, and, <laughs> One of his best mates. <laughs> I know, but like, okay, so you can sort of extrapolate that and say, right, well, his treatment of her for ghosting him, um, maybe... You know, it's a relentless smear campaign. He's trying to take her down. Some would call that bullying. But why would this guy who complained that he wanted to poke the bear um, think that, that he was the victim? And obviously Piers Morgan, who's like the least victim person I've ever met, um, would come back and, and say that he was because he's got a really good point. Uh, Robbo, uh, have you got anything to add to this one? <laughs> oh, so. I've got so much. The problem is, right, that uh, there are so many snowflakes that now work in media, right? So uh, live television, for example, or any kind of television production is, it can be high pressure, high stress, and that's just the way it is. Uh, I first started my career at Sunrise, uh, and David Walters, Dougie, is one of the best, if not the best, live producers uh, well, the second best, rather. Shit, I forgot. Yeah, yeah thank you very much. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, oh, the second oh, best, but he's he absolutely amazing. Me, so, you know. Yeah, he's amazing. <laughs> so between six and nine, I was the guest creator for Sunrise. I had a headset on. Uh, if I stuffed up, and rightly so, you know, it, it wouldn't be a, hey, Robbo, can you please just... It, of course it wouldn't be that. Now, the wonderful thing was, is you got yelled at, you got screamed at, you, you went and did your job properly. Uh, at 9 a.m., uh, I would have to put my headset back in the control room and we'd walk back to the production office together having a great laugh and having mm. a good time yeah. because that's mm. what people should be like. Too many people who work in television now uh, in, or in any kind of, uh, you know, kind of production in TV, especially live television, uh, get a little bit... Uh, <laughs> when someone yells at them and says, can you get that guest in or can you can you get that script or can you do that? You just bloody do it. Um, the, the problem arises if that continues on throughout the day after the show's finished. But my, my experience has been in the high octane, high pressure, high stress world of television, um, as long as it ends within that kind of bubble, then it's fine. But, but often, and I know many, 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 many people who don't, who aren't able to do that. So then they write things like this. Also, this guy wanted attention for Christ's sake. But like when he's writing um, Piers Morgan and like with the asterisk and stuff, he wanted it to be picked up. This has probably got him a lot more Definitely. followers. This is just absolute That's exactly what I was thinking. rubbish. You just yeah, get on absolutely. with it. And you, you know, TV, t- sorry, Robert, I was just going to say, TV is bloody brutal. Like, you know, live TV um, is just, it's a shocker. But, you know, whenever I've done it, um, you know, as an anchor, albeit, 
God, at Sky News in the UK, the most violent, evil place I've ever worked in my life. You never saw, um, you know, anybody, none of the runners or, you know, the interns, they weren't crying and they were being screamed at every single day by like 30 different people properly screamed at. And they were just grateful to have a job there. Yeah. Well, and, you know, and, and, here's the thing. I've done a lot of live TV, TV over the years and I have remained perfectly calm, not even a blip when I'm doing uh-huh. that. Okay, I've, I've, got a, yeah. I've got to go. Right. I'm out. See ya. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. I'm with you, Robo. That was said with sarcasm. <laughs> Oh, he thinks I was serious. Has he stopped <laughs> lying yet? Did, did you really think stopped... I was serious when I was saying that? No, I was I was being a comedy dumb. I can't explain. <laughs> okay, good, good. <laughs> I'll, explain. Right. I'll explain television to you after. However, though. Oh, yeah, you move around. I've been frozen. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I've right. been it's, frozen. It's done by... wonders for the automatic uh, uh, colour temperature. No. Uh, you know what? Mm-hmm. I literally am going to have to come up this weekend and fix your camera because it's uh, beyond the pain. Why don't you buy All me right. a drink first? <laughs> Let's move on. Well, whether it's Brussels sprouts, beans or broccoli, there is always something we refuse to eat when our parents served it up to us as kids. And Aussies are still sharing the dishes they still won't touch. Submissions included ham and pineapple with a slice of cheese, steak and kidney pie with beans, corn, beef, meatloaf and rice pudding. Ange, is Mm. there a food or meal you just can't stand? Um, there are a few. I absolutely loathe garlic, um, which made living in Asia very challenging. Um, but um, when I grew up, because that was it was talking about how, um, you know, kids didn't like something when they were little that their parents made and and so they couldn't eat them now. Um, I didn't have anything like that at home because my mum only cooked on birthdays and, you know, how much can you hate pikelets and fairy bread? Um, (laughs) So it was, but I did after that go to boarding school in England and oh my God, there I learned to loathe certain things um, like Brussels sprouts for Christmas that had been put on in November. Um, But I had Brussels sprouts tonight and they were delicious. Something else that I, ha- oh God, this is awful. So anything with offal in it, it's just, for God's sake, people, it's not wartime. No. It is not wartime. <laughs> you don't need to eat the insides of an animal. And so when it was like steak and kidney, I'd have a little trick where you'd see on the big board what they were serving. Um, and I'd go there and scratch and scratch and scratch myself until I made this great big red welt. And then I'd pretend that I'd eaten some of the offending oh kidney God. and go up to, to one of the matrons and go, matron, look, I can't possibly, I can't, I'm terribly allergic. And I still won't get near it. Foul. <laughs> <laughs> Can I, I, I know my mum's sure. watching tonight and I've never told her this. My, oh God, are you sure now's the right time? <laughs> my parents probably still do make corn beef hash. And what they do is what? take uh, corned beef and ma- mash it. No, not hash. Oh, well, yeah, it is called corned beef hash. You just said corned beef yeah. hash. Yeah. <laughs> but it's not that Wanna kind of it? hash. They take corned <laughs> beef and they mix it up with um, mashed potato and it's like pink mashed potato. And it oh. is disgusting. Oh. And it was a oh. staple for us when we were kids. And... I'm sorry, Mum. I didn't like it. Don't like it. Don't want to eat it again. <laughs> Can we get mm. Mummy McKnight on the feedback line? Uh, she is. She has been commenting tonight. I'm just waiting for a comment to pop up. To be honest. <laughs> oh, I, I love Mummy McKnight, and I love Daddy McKnight too. I oh, normally I call you that. Actually, uh, Granddaddy McKnight. I, I like. <laughs> right. Yeah, no, no. You're you're like the colours of the rainbow at the moment. Your camera just keeps changing. Like well, he would. He would love that. <laughs> Not me. <laughs> we might need to. Can I can I quickly talk about my little? Uh, my mother used to cook, and she Please. still says now that I love it, and I don't. I don't love it. Oh, not that I live with my parents. Uh, that was as if she was close by. Um, <laughs> that um, um, savory mint, savory mints with peas. I friggin hated savory. That's mints what with my peas. stepdad used to know as curry. Uh, it te- That's what they used to call terrible. curry in the early days. Yeah, yeah. I might as well just eat some bread with dripping. 
But that's that's a very old. <laughs> All right, kind of, uh, the feedbacks are coming back in, and uh, we're going to see what everyone else says. And uh, nothing from Mum. Oh, yeah, hang on. Uh, she says Dad still loves corned beef mash. So there you go. Um, I would love corned beef mash. <laughs> oh, Hi, yeah. um, uh, Grandma McKnight and Granddaddy McKnight. Well, Mum's Mum and Dad are coming up in. Uh, Hi. April over the school holidays, so Robbo, you can come down and have some corned beef mash. I'll oh, get takeaway. Love... You can have the corned beef mash. All right. I would love the corned beef mash. Forget about it. Okay. You go pack right. my bag. You Look, do the next there's, bit. Yeah. There's still so much to come on the and Rob and Robbo show. We'll be checking with Jason Roses very soon, and we'll be meeting the guys who play competitive snowballing. This is seriously one of the funniest stories you're going to see today. But in the meantime, let's get a news update with Ange. Indeed, some of the other stories making headlines on this Tuesday, February the 23rd, 2021. People on unemployment benefits will receive an extra $25 a week under the Job Seeker scheme from April, taking the weekly total to $307. Scott Morrison says the payment is now 41% of minimum wage, adding that the boost is appropriate. Job Seeker has been falling behind relative poverty lines for the last two decades. The new payment requires more from recipients, including more monthly job searches and face to face meetings with employment services. A mere six days after Facebook banned all Australian news on its platform, the tech giant has backtracked on the controversial decision. The reversal will happen in the next few days and follows changes to the news media and digital bargaining code. Essentially, the government was pressing Facebook to pay for news on its site, something Facebook slapped right down. Key to the government's negotiations with Mark Zuckerberg was Josh Frydenberg, happily adding today that Facebook has refriended Australia. President Joe Biden has marked a tragic milestone in the US today, with the country passing half a million COVID-related deaths. The toll is by far the highest in the world, the number of American lives lost being greater than deaths from both World Wars and the Vietnam War combined. The US is still recording upwards of 70,000 new cases on average every day. Despite the rollout of vaccines from mid-December, the University of Washington predicts almost 590,000 people will have died from coronavirus by June the first. When Elon Musk tweets, the world apparently listens. At least that's what happened when Bitcoin plunged sharply after he said simply, value seems high. The famously erratic cryptocurrency dropped 17% after a record high yesterday of over $74,000. Musk's comments follow Tesla's recent purchase of $2 billion in Bitcoin, the company already raking in 1.26 billion bucks from the investment. The world's richest man, Musk, predicted there would be growing volatility for Bitcoin, Bitcoin going forward. Yep, when he's right, he's right. And stunning images from NASA's Perseverance rover recording what it's like to land on another planet for the first time. Having deployed from its craft, the rover executed a perfect touchdown on Mars, carried by a parachute which hurtled towards the surface of the red planet at 1,500 kilometers an hour, a journey described by NASA as seven minutes of terror. The rover will collect rock samples from Mars, but it'll be a few more months before the hunt for ancient life begins in this mission, slated to end in 2023. And a quick check for you now of tomorrow's weather, partly cloudy and 33 for Cairns, showers for Brisbane and a top of 28. A few showers around and 25 for Sydney, while there'll be partial cloud for Canberra and a top of 21. Partial cloudy also for Melbourne and a max of just 20. Hobart, meanwhile, will also be cloudy with a top of 22. Mostly sunny though in Adelaide, getting up to 23. The sun will be out in Perth and a balmy 32. Sun and 33 for Alice Springs, but showers and a possible storm for Darwin and 29 degrees. Now it is time to delve into the torrid world of celebrity and entertainment. And who better to do that perfect, I would say, than our very own Jason Roses. Jason, Hello. I know that you I have been, been quite a news. celebrity lately. Coming on the show, we're going to be talking about holy moly and an accident going on the show might have had, and I guess the Channel 7's decision to play that. Um, we're going to be talking about Woody Allen uh, and a new documentary that uh, is discussing the molestation accusations that have been plaguing his life for the last decade. Maths, of course, returned to television last night. And the ratings, I'm gonna be telling you all about how successful they were. And of course, Chappelle Corby, she may or may not be starring up 
in an u- upcoming television series. And I'll tell you more about that later coming up on the Ange, Rob and Robbo show. I'll tell you right now why the maths ratings was up because it was for our very own Jason Roses. I've got to work out which way to point to him. I That's why the ratings it. were up. Yes, I was in the wedding. That's right. That's why the ratings were up, Jason. Jason, I can't wait to chat to you and see you. I think you were calling a garlic off air, but it's a Dalek with a D. But we'll talk about your, your garlic <laughs> Dalek a little later. But for now, all right, get off Still my frame. Know. Yeah, okay, get off my frame. There we go. He'll be back later. But for now, it's time to check out what happened on this day, the 23rd of February, throughout history. Let's have a look. And it was on this day in 1940 when we were introduced to the world's most favourite marionette, Pinocchio. The movie not only continues to live on through celluloid, but there are also over 65 million pieces of original artwork from the film carefully housed in climate-controlled vaults at Disney. 65 million, can you believe that? There we go. Now, if you were part of the LGBTQI plus community in 1999, you probably were very excited on this day. It was the premiere of one of the first television drama series to follow the lives of gay guys. It ran for two seasons in the UK, but also was remade with the Canadian cast a few years later. And finally, it was on this day in 2013 that the Twilight Saga Breaking Dawn Part 2 cleaned up at the Golden Raspberry Awards. This terrible movie won Worst Picture (laughs) as well as seven other awards, and in that year it was the most nominated movie of that very important ceremony. What a terrible... <laughs> loved it, though. Wonderful, yeah. For all of our millennials, I absolutely loved it. Books were great. Movies were great. Oh, I can't wait to never rewatch them again. Robert, back to you. Thank you very much, sir. Well, to some it may be just a fun pastime, but to others, snowball fighting is their life. Yuki Garson is a snowball fighting competition originating in Japan and previously dominated by the Japanese. But watch out because Team Canada met them on the slopes and you snow what? Yes, I said snow what? Here to tell us all about it are two of the members. Welcome, Nathan and Anthony, to the And Robin Robbo Show. Hey, thank you for having us. We're happy to be here. It feels nice to just be having your warm Australian presence kind of coming through the airwaves here, knowing that we're on Australian television. It's just kind of warming our souls in this minus 50 Canadian weather we're currently in. So. Couldn't agree more, hey, Whoa, whoa, whoa. Minus 50, uh, is that degrees Celsius? That is Celsius, that is Celsius. And uh, yeah, it's about as cold as it gets. Uh, Saskatoon, Saskatchewan, where we are, it usually every year, at, I'd say for about a week at some points, gets the coldest place on planet Earth. Yeah. Um, you know, and it's just terrible. You know, the machines don't want to start the cars, you got to plug in the cars and the snowballs are literally solid rocks at that point. Now you're just whipping hard stones at each other. So it's, Yeah, well, uh, the snow doesn't like to compact at that cold, so we end up watering it down a little bit. Yeah. And then the water freezes, and just those are basically balls of ice. So yeah. Sometimes we had beer as well, so there's a little flavor at least. When you get smashed <laughs> yeah. in the face, you yeah. kind of get a That's sip. That's right, and it's kind well. of a trick. It's a, you know, yellow snow. You never know. <laughs> <laughs> yellow snow, you never know. <laughs> so Nate has a sauna in his house, so, like, he has the opportunity to That's really true. heat up, and uh, I'm just trying to stay alive here. I, I keep those Aussie temps kind of always at a finger's tip, you know, just to make sure we can grab that. That heat when we need it to really just do the breath work too. I'm big in that Wim Hof. It's all about that Yuki Gossin training. You know, if you want to be one with the snow, you have to have some internal heat. You know, it's like a volcano. I've got to say, I had no idea professional snow fighting was a sport. How does it actually work, guys? Well, it's a it's a pretty wild ancient Japanese tradition. I mean, a lot of people don't know about this, uh, but it's growing in popularity around the world. Um, so it's seven on seven. You've got these pre-pressed snowballs with these steel snowball presses that make like perfect snowballs. I'm talking the hardest, most perfect balls you've ever witnessed. And uh, they presses 50 snowballs at, at once. A time. There. And oh, then, wow. yeah, you've got some footage here. Then you're just whipping these things. Here's the presses being made there. They're whipping them up there. And you got to just really know what you're doing with the balls. They're so inspecting the, the, the balls. The rules are basically 90 snowballs per period. There's three periods. Yeah. If you get hit, you're out. And there's also flags on either side of the court. And if you get to the other side without getting hit and snag of the other team's flag, it's an automatic win. Yeah, that's um, an auto win. But but first and foremost, it's the game of, of honor. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, I was and, and, uh, and it's it's almost like a, a chess a chess man the thinking man snowball fight. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it's all it's all really about being a ninja and just trying to like mm. find your inner snowball warrior and then bringing that to the field, translating so, that to the court. Yeah. Well, gentlemen, I've always thought of when I think of bullfighting, I think of, uh, you know, capture the flag and dodgeball. Uh, that's the way I always was taught when I was training. I, I've obviously been through a lot of championships myself. Is that the way that you look at it? You think of those two sports and then and then train that way? Yeah, so I would take that, you know, dodgeball, capture the flag, paintball, and then I would also add you know, just pure tactical military training. I would say that's kind yep. of, you, 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 you sum those all together and you're pretty yeah. close to. And when we went to, to, when we went to Japan, a big part of our training is we figured that we had to really immerse ourselves in the Japanese culture yes. in order to better understand how Japan has dominated the sport for over 30 years. Yeah. I mean, we're Prairie Canadian boys. We grew up throwing snow. We were throwing snowballs out of the womb. Yeah. So we went yeah. over to Japan and figured oh kind of like, heck, we we're going to just walk right through this thing and take just clean it right up. Take Absolutely. Gold. When we went to Japan, we realized, you know, these guys are very good at this sport. There's a lot yeah. of, uh, there's Olympic baseball players that uh, play this in the off season. So let me tell you, we had our work cut out for us. And, yeah. Uh, yeah. but uh, it was quite an adventure and uh, we got a film about it. And um, so you'll have to see what, uh, how, how it all plays out. Yeah. Don't yeah. want to give too much away. So, no, hey, no. I, I, you've got a film about it? So we, we started, we, we're both filmmakers, and we just thought that this was just the most ridiculous adventure ever. Yeah. Um, so we just started rolling cameras on it, basically, as soon as we uh, won that first national championship. And uh, it's quite a tale. I mean, you got 10 Canadian Prairie boys going out to uh, Japan, and, and the, the event itself is held at the base of a smoldering volcano, Mount Shawashinzan. Yeah. in the northern island of uh, a Japan called Hokkaido. Yeah. Uh, we also stopped in Sapporo and tip just for taste testing. Yeah, we had to try this before. <laughs> the, 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 the local beverages were on point. What we're showing here actually with footage is the biggest training we did, which was actually setting the Guinness World Record for the largest snowball fight on planet Earth oh. in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. And, uh, you know, the, it was just an absolute send fest i mean we were just kind of non-stop you know ripping around japan and then in saskatchewan and then we got flown out to toronto doing a full press junket so the movie really just sort of is a fly on the wall of this insane experience of us you know not only becoming snowball fighting warriors but also becoming uh you know canadian celebrities and and then on to international celebrities when japan tourism and well, their and media that, that was the whole point of the world record snowball fight to be honest is here here we are technically we win this we miraculously win this event here yeah. we're technically now professional athletes yeah and uh so how what better way to let people know that this sport even exists than we're thinking boom world record yeah and uh seattle uh in the states currently had it we couldn't think of a city less deserving to be honest uh, we, thought that, we thought that canada really deserved that title i mean and we were happy to do our part and help make it help bring it home so, yeah so i just wanted to ask you boys uh obviously how many balls in the face do you get and can you put balls in the face in the competition oh yeah, yeah. balls oh, in yeah. the face are a big part of the game i'd say probably number one and when you think back on it, the amount of balls is just, it's almost, you know, you lose count, right? I mean, uh, once, oh. once you've got hit by a thousand balls. Now, they, they do have a protective face shield that you'll see in Japan. When we were training in Canada, uh, well, first we just started going on nothing, you know, yeah. out, out nothing. And then there was a broken tooth and our buddy uh, uh, DT on the team, he had to get stitches, yeah. blew his lip out. And uh, so then we started wearing hockey helmets. Yeah. So um, the Canadian version of Yuki Gosson was a lot more hillbilly. You know, it was a little bit more in the outback. Uh, we were, you know, throwing the balls as hard as we could at our best friends' faces. And, and sure enough, it wasn't actually leading to the best result. And uh, so then we started to, to understand, okay, maybe some protective gear is, is necessary to 
do this for the long term because we're not just wanting to ride this wave for a quick moment. We want to become snowball legends, you know, and that's that's really what it's all about for us. You're also in a band, you're musicians, you're in a band called Bombago. And yes. I love this. Taylor Swift included one of your songs in her Songs I Love Spotify playlist. That was a bit of a moment, wasn't it? Oh, dude, the craziest moment. We live in the middle of nowhere. Like, we live in Saskatoon, Saskatchewan. It would be, like, comparable to living in the center of Australia. You know, like, we're just as far from, uh, you know, any big cities as you can be, far from the ocean as you can be. And so when we are sitting there eating noodles at this restaurant and get a text from a friend that says, hey, your guy's song got shared on Taylor Swift's Spotify playlist, we all started laughing. Yeah, just we thinking, thought like, it was a joke. This is a joke. Like, someone's pulling our leg. And then, sure enough, we get a few more texts. And finally, I'm like, okay, we got to look into this. We start looking. I'm looking at this list. It's like Kendrick Lamar, Ed Sheeran, Camilla, you know, like the biggest pop stars in the world. And then it's like Bombargo. And we start freaking out in this I noodle bet. restaurant. We're like spilling drinks and losing our minds. <laughs> and yeah, it was, it was incredible. It was incredible. It was a bit of a scene. And we've been trying desperately to get a hold of Taylor yes. to thank her and see if we can maybe play a, play her a little rendition of Mr. No Good, maybe yeah. an acoustic private show. Yeah. And uh, well, guys, guys, we don't. You, <laughs> we, 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 this, we've, we've. I, I don't want to get you excited, but we've organized something for you now. Taylor Swift, no, she's not here yet, but when she does contact you, <laughs> can you please make sure you come on our show to do it? Sorry, Taylor, just, we're not ready yet for you, Carl. Um, yeah, when that does happen, can you come on our show to do that, please? Yeah. We would absolutely we would love, to. love to. And yeah, yeah, you know, she's a hard girl to get a hold of. We have uh, been trying throwing Hail Marys just as far as we can. And, uh, you know, one day I know that we're going to and we're going to play her that song and we can't wait for that day to happen. Because for us, it's just so crazy. Like, how did you hear about this indie band in the middle of nowhere in Canada that, you know, that you, you found and, a song? And it's really transformed, like, the trajectory, to, tra the trajectory of our band as well. So oh, yeah. not only do we want to play her the song, but we have to thank her, too, because it's yeah. just been it, it really helped uh, uh, our career quite so a much. ride. Yeah. Well, what I'll do is I'll give Taylor a call in the morning. So stand by. We'll make this happen. Yeah. And uh, we'll see if we can get you an audience with Tay Tay. Hey, Nathan uh, and Anthony, thank you so much for coming on the Andrew Robin Robo Show. We love you guys. Just keep doing what you're doing down there. Yeah, thanks so much. It's the Red Life Shot of the Day. Where are you going today? You never know where you'll end up with the Red Life Shot of the Day. Uh, <clears throat> I'd love to keep doing what they're doing down there. Uh, th th thanks to the boys there. They're, they're wonderful. Uh, <laughs> I mean, if, if we're, uh, like they're, they're, in, they're in the snow at the moment, so snow means Christmas. What would I want for Christmas? Maybe the one with the moustache. Uh, anyway, uh, let's they have... They both had moustaches. Did they? Anyway, they All right, random well, I'll, live shot of the day, which talking I'll take about both snowballs of them. is at the snow. And... <laughs> That's right. Yay. Tonight we're taking you to Finland. This is the city of Lissalimini. Lissalimini. I you. <laughs> no, I like saying it without any warning. Uh, it's the second largest of the five towns in all, northern Savonia. In terms of population, Lissalimini traces its roots back to 1627 when the parish of Lissalimini was formed around the local church. It's heading for a high of, wait for it, minus 15 degrees after a low, a very chilly low of minus 13 degrees. Let's have a look now. As we battle, battle torrential rain here at the uh, the Sunshine Coast Bureau of the Ant, Rob and Robbo Show, Amanda says, man, there are so many foods that I can't eat that eating out is a nightmare. Don't get me started. Big Mother Oz says, I can't stand anchovies on pizza. Are these the right... What, when were we talking about what? topics... When, that was topic was five. This? We were talking about foods you didn't like as a kid that you don't eat now. Oh, right, all right, all right. Welcome right, to right. the Andrew Robin Robbo Show. Yeah. Are you watching Married at First Sight? Oh, my God. Where were you? Yeah, because I loved I loved Jason. Here we go. Mary says, I can't handle anything with Keen's curry. Oh, you're as keen as mustard. That's where that uh, saying comes from. Uh, also, as we look at that wonderful winter wonderland, we try to find Elsa. She's there somewhere, and we're going to get a live cross with her soon. MVP Madsen says, another I can't stand is corned beef soup. Oh, and that was on I Twitch. love corned beef. Yeah, but I don't care for the corned beef soup. That's right, Rob just mentioned there, we are on Twitch. Just go to the Ange Robin Robbo Show on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. 
But if you're going on the other ones, just go to at the ARR show. <laughs> I'm trying to read it off the off the bloody no, super. It's on Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube. It's at the ARR show. That's on what... everything else, it's Andrew Robbo. So It'd be great if our social media producer could put there that in go. the script for me. Just so. <laughs> oh, there it is. Oh, it changes <laughs> there. We've, yeah. got, we've got Jason waiting. Jason is standing sorry, Jason, by sorry. to bring us the very latest <laughs> entertainment news. And Jason. <laughs> We've been talking about the accident with Denise Drysdale since before you were even on this show, and mm. we're actually going to see the footage of her accident on Holy Moly. We're going to see it because it was reported, guys, on TV Black Box that Denise Drysdale did sustain a shoulder industry, uh, in injury blah, while filming for Holy Moly. And at the time, the executives at Seven were considering whether they were going to show the accident or not. But take a look at the promo, which shows this injury happening as it speaks. And the moment that made national headlines. What happened to Denise Drysdale? Doesn't look like she's going to be able to continue. Bradbury has Sorry. pulled another Bradbury. Sorry, I've got to jump in there. TV Black Box broke that story. TV Black Box was yes. all over the story. They put TV Tonight up there, news.com.au and some other place. Channel 7. Sue. Sue them. <laughs> that was unfair. Yes. Probably that was unfair. Off. And I didn't really see her fall or an injury, but I think it was a bad shoulder thing going on. So... Anyway, mm. it seems fake Can to I me. Can I suggest, anyway. though, I, I'm worried, I'm worried, though. Uh, obviously, we know her shoulder was hurt, but she had a very bad bleach job. I think that maybe that might have uh, <laughs> uh, contributed to the... <laughs> to the... Um, to the injury. <laughs> wow. Well, Jason, what do you, you think? You know what? I'm, I'm on the verge of aborting tonight's episode because we've just if gone off the rails. If you want to watch Celebrity... Holy moly, this Sunday, 7 p.m., oh, Channel 7. Yeah, nicely done, Jace. Um, let's move on, shall we? Um, and talk about something Thank happier. You. Woody Allen. That's a happy topic. <laughs> um, I don't think this is happier. <laughs> I know. He's not very happy with a new docuseries examining those allegations that he molested his adopted daughter. What was said? Oh, no, he's very upset. Woody Allen and his wife, Sunyi Praven, they've gone and attacked this HBO documentary. And all this documentary is doing, it's re-examining this decades-old allegation that the Oscar winner molested his daughter. Now, this new series basically covers extensive interviews from his former partner, Mia Farrow, and his adopted daughter, Dylan Farrow. And, of course, they repeat the accusations that Alan sexually assaulted Dylan in 1992. He's come out with a statement because he's obviously furious. He's constantly denied this through the years. And this is what he's had to say. They spent years collaborating with Pharaohs and their enablers to put together a hatchet job riddled with falsehoods. As has been known for decades, these allegations are categorically false. Whilst this shoddy hit piece may gain attention it does not change the facts. So he's obviously rightfully very, very upset. But of course, then there's the other side. His daughter is saying that, yes, she was sexually assaulted. And she's gone and put on Twitter, thank you to everyone for their kind words. The outpouring of support means more to me than I can say. Speaking the truth is so difficult, but I hope any fellow survivors who watched last night know they are not alone. The truth is something that cannot be changed. So it, it is very sad because it seems as though we're not getting any closer to the truth as to who is telling the truth. I don't know. It's it's a lot going on. There, there, there is certainly a lot going on there, Jason. Well, obviously, uh, you'll keep us across any uh, elements that come up from that story. Let's change gears for a moment. Uh, last night, I don't watch television, but I watched it last night, and I think everyone else in Australia did as well. Huge night on maths. Any idea why it was such a big episode of maths? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's because I was on it. I I yeah. attended. <laughs> Woo! Uh, yes. We, That's we why the rating was six success. seconds of fame last night on the show. <laughs> okay, it was like a minute, and it because was, yeah. of my Shut minute, up, Rob. <laughs> yeah. like a minute, but Rob. not a minute. <laughs> 
literally Rob's just Rob's just jealous because of Absolutely. my one minute of fame. Yeah, yeah. married at first sight. They went and destroyed Amazing Race and Holy Moly in the ratings, and they racked up nine hundred and sixty-four thousand. So it would, of course, I would be worried seven because. They're not rating well. Home and Away is under 500,000. Holy moly's under 500,000. I have a suggestion. They could put me on their programs and it would rate really well. <laughs> well, Jason, I think yeah. they need the double yes. trifecta. If you're going to quote websites, quote TV, t TV, I almost said TV Tonight. Oh, 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 oh no. Very no, good. Don't quote that TV Tonight's a good website too, <laughs> but quote TV Black Box. And put Jason Roses on your show, surefire winner. Um, but can we just show this shot? This was an article the Daily Mail did about you. And I tell you what, Jason, if the rumours I've heard are anything close to the truth, you will be featured again because my understanding is you actually come back on Married at First Sight. <gasps> and let's just say oh, wow. drama, it, drama follows you wherever you go. Oh, don't say that. There is a lot of drama. So I attended... Bryce and Melissa's uh, uh, wedding. Don't reveal anything. That's uh, for later. No. Yeah. That's okay. For later. That was a, that was the tease. The tease. Oh, <laughs> I almost revealed it, but I didn't. <laughs> hey, now this is a big story, Jason. A few celebrities appearing on Dancing with the Stars have been revealed, but there's someone unexpected who might be taking to the floor. Very unexpected, and I think I revealed her name a little earlier on. <laughs> it's actually. <laughs> <laughs> I'm new to this. Well, it is Chappelle Corby. I know. It is Chappelle Corby. And she <laughs> has apparently signed on with Seven's Dancing with the Stars. Of course, we all know Chappelle. She was convicted on drug smuggling charges in Indonesia. She appeared on SAS last year for Channel 7. But uh, apparently she will be coming on Dancing with the Stars and the other personalities that are going to be joining the show this year, rumoured to be, is Lincoln Loon, Lewis, Renee Barr, Fifi Box, and of course the hosts being Daryl Summers and Sonia Kruger. So I'm going to be interested to see how Chappelle goes. Will they lock up? No, I'm not even going to say a joke. No. <laughs> Just don't let it pack her own bag. Um, we have to go. <laughs> um, I, I was going to say, well, that <laughs> it was a joke. It was a joke. Oh, um, what I will Bob, say, I Jason, that. is what was I going to say? Oh, that was a good story I'm from TV right Tonight. Now. We just mentioned TV Tonight. That story actually <laughs> came from TV Tonight. It was actually a really good get. I, you know, I always acknowledge the opposition when they do good stuff. That was a good. That was a good get. And let me tell you, I'm going to confirm it right now. Chappelle Corby is on the show. Really? You right now, How do you know that? This? I've been investigating today ever since I heard that from TV tonight, and he's right on the money. Um, so there you go. Robbo, we're going to let you go before your house floods, or your studios <laughs> flood, studios. And we'll see. Jason, thank you. Ange, thank you. We'll see you tomorrow on the Ange Rob and Robbo Show. Bruno's in tomorrow. Make sure you don't miss it. Oh, God.